We mentioned polar amplification before. We will look at it here again because this is obviously critical for global warming time scales. Already it's evident that the Arctic sea ice is looking uh, very vulnerable to warming and Arctic warming as we can see here uh, has been uh, definitely amplified uh, quite a bit compared to everywhere else. Uh, we mentioned this already before. This is looking at the difference of the decade of 2010 to 2019 uh, compared to uh, the average over 1951 to 1978. So it gives you a sense of uh, the warming of the last decade compared to the uh, earlier period where the warming was not so evident. And you can see that there's a huge amplification here of almost uh, four times and as we also mentioned before the uh, Antarctic polar amplification is not so clear uh, main reason mentioned again is uh, the ozone hole which creates a different temperature uh, uh, energy balance and the sea ice which is very predominant here in the Arctic uh, is not a big player in the Antarctic Southern Ocean obviously has uh, shelf ice that uh, is glaciers flowing on to the ocean uh, on slopes and they are uh, vulnerable to other processes of melting from bef below because of ocean warming and so on but obviously doesn't pro uh, create a systematic uh, polar amplification like this. I myself always uh, say uh, casually that this is obviously related to ice albedo feedback but uh, we have to be careful nonetheless because more and more data shows that uh, clouds and water vapor feedbacks are actually quite critical in addition to the ice albedo feedback in the Arctic um, polar amplification. Uh, the question also is whether polar amplification also occurred in past climates and it turns out that uh, it did. And you can also look at the seasonality of the polar amplification. Uh, this is looking at uh, DJF, December, January, February, uh, Northern Hemisphere winter, uh, spring, summer and uh, fall. And you can see that the polar amplification is maximum in the winter. Uh, so the equator to pole temperature gradient gets flattened quite a bit and that we have to mention because uh, energy transport and other cascades uh, would be related to that and there is a different pattern in the other seasons uh, but you can see that in fall already amplification begins to uh, take hold and gets stronger in the summer. Uh, this is also important because fall warming can mean uh, the summer melt being much stronger. Whatever sea ice doesn't melt by September is more likely to refreeze and grow in the winter months but if uh, fall warming is very large then that melt uh, can make winter ice growth very difficult and accelerate the loss of sea ice for example. Okay, there are lots of details there in terms of whether uh, tropical uh, processes and tropical warming. Uh, you have to remember another thing actually, tropical temperatures are very warm already. So small warming here can still be very important in terms of the atmosphere responding to it because smaller warming on top of a warm sea surface temperature can increase the water vapor uh, evaporation and the feedbacks in terms of increased precipitation or condensation in the atmosphere or moisture transport and uh, so on. Um, so nonetheless the uh, idea that these can produce uh, perturbations in convection those convection perturbations are heat sources that can prop, uh, set off waves and those waves sometimes carry uh, heat uh, poleward. Okay? So there are all sorts of nasty details that we are not uh, mentioning here much but we want to really focus on polar amplification. So even from models it's clear that even during the last glacial maximum 20-21 thousand years ago there was polar amplification. So if you look at the uh, modeled current uh, climate and the last glacial climate 
and you take the difference you can clearly see that even the cold phase of the last glacial maximum had maximum cooling in the north and considering that there were large ice sheets especially on North uh, America and uh, parts of Europe which uh, you see here uh, ice albedo feedback would have been uh, different so it's possible that the feedbacks are different whether you are going into a cold phase or a warm phase for creating um, polar amplification so polar amplification is uh, occurring in both the warm phase and the cold phase so in addition to ice albedo feedback which we talked about for example if you melt uh, sea ice you're going to reduce the albedo ocean is going to absorb more radiation it's going to warm further and it's going to melt more sea ice which is going to further reduce the albedo so you have a runaway warming situation uh, and the other way if ice builds you increase albedo reduce energy absorption cool further and so on but data shows that uh, there are all sorts of other feedback okay there is a ocean heat transport and circulation involved arctic is uh, actually got a very unique circulation happening especially around greenland uh, into uh, norwegian seas and uh, over barents sea and uh, other seas in the Arctic. Uh, we saw one gyre circulation in the past uh, in the fir first or second chapter. You can look that up again. Uh, top of the atmosphere radiation uh, imbalances uh, relating to cloud property changes, cloud optical depths, uh, uh, ice albedo feedback of course uh, through these kind of uh, uh, opening reduced albedo increased energy absorption and so on uh, you also have a water vapor feedback as soon as you begin to warm the temperatures you're going to have water vapor feedback and this is the lapse rate feedback so you can see that this can be negative because you lose more energy with warming this can be negative or positive depending on uh, what is dominating whether it's the uh, reflectivity that's increasing or uh, the absorption of uh, uh, long wave and short wave that is increasing. Water vapor feedback is obviously positive. Lapse rate feedback uh, is positive. So this is the temperature gradient. Uh, atmospheric heat and transport, uh, atmospheric heat transport and circulation. Uh, no, uh, no sign attached to these two. But it's pretty clear now that uh, warm waters do inundate the Arctic uh, from this pathway from the uh, lower mid-latitude uh, uh, into the Arctic oceans uh, below the surface okay that is potentially related to uh, Atlantic meridional overturning circulation as well we will see that the response of the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation also depends on how the warming or uh, cooling perturbation to the circulation is introduced whether it's through glaciation or whether it's through uh, increased greenhouse gases so the story is obviously complicated uh, we will come back and look at the uh, contrasts in land and ocean warming uh, just because there are also dynamic details associated with that for example if land warms faster than the ocean then you set up pressure gradients and wind changes which can create specific uh, ocean response which can again relate to ocean heat uptake and so on so all these details do you have to know each of them well you have to be aware of each of them uh, and that's why we are going through these